Hello, music fans. My name is Kathy Rankin, and thanks for joining us today. And I am very excited about the interview we're doing today because I am joined by two incredible musicians from the band Fifth Angel, Ken Mary, drummer and producer, original founding member, and Steve Carlson, who is the lead vocalist and who is just owning that role. And you guys, they have a brand new album, When Angels Kill, coming out. It drops June 16th on Nuclear Blast. So welcome, you guys. Thanks for stopping by and talking to us. Thanks so much for having us. So we have a lot to talk about with the new music. But before we get going on the details, Ken, I want to start with you since you've been there from the beginning of Fifth Angel. And how did the band regroup and why did you guys decide to do this fourth album? Sure. Well, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to Oliver at Keep It True. Mm. Uh, Fifth Angel started uh, playing at the Keep It True festivals around 2010, and that was sort of the first inkling that we had that maybe Fifth Angel as a brand, as a band was a lot bigger in Europe than we had imagined. We started putting together music, uh, and Yap uh, Wagemaker over at Nuclear Blast heard some of the songs and, and signed the band, uh, but basically it was you know what got us back into it was really just kind of meeting some of the fans and, and seeing the energy and excitement that the fans had about the band and that sort of got us back into writing new music. So then Steve how did you enter the picture how did you hook up with the guys and become part of the band? Uh, let's see bribery. <laughs> What did they bribe you with? That's the question. <laughs> no, I bribed you said, them. Look, you're gonna... <laughs> you bribed them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had a friend, uh, actually a mutual friend, uh, Mike Gobby. Who, uh, I know Mike. Yeah, he, he uh, mentioned my name to the guys, and they were looking for uh, a singer to do a, a, a tour to cover Ted's uh, parts. And then their guitar player at the time was going to uh, sing and play his parts. Uh, so I came on board for that reason. They interviewed a few people, and I got the job. Steve was in the music scene in Seattle back when Fifth Angel was starting in uh, around 1984, 1985. So uh, what's ironic is we all kind of grew up in the Seattle music scene and then we didn't find him till I was living down in Phoenix and he was working in Phoenix. So it's it's kind of a cool connection that we have that Mm -hmm. we're all from Seattle. Yeah. And another band, Queensryche, was in Seattle around the same time. Did you guys ever run into the same circles of people with those guys? I did. Not yeah. me, but yeah, Ken. Yeah, sure. Like we knew, you know, we certainly knew of Queensryche, and as a matter of fact, I remember talking to uh, some of the guys in the band before they released their first EP, and they were just saying that they had recorded at the studio, and and they were excited about it, and, and said, well, you know, we're just, they, they spent their own money, and they said, well, it's just money, you know, and, and uh, sure enough, it ended up coming out and just being huge. So, but yeah, the, the scene there with Queensryche, Metal Church, Air Apparent, uh, Fifth Angel, um, I think there were some other bands too that were sort of like at the core of the metal scene in Seattle. Right. That's before, ironically, grunge took off around 92 mm-hmm. and sort of did a good job of wiping a lot of that out. But, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but is it, that why you guys had a bit of a break then? Because there, there are a lot of Fifth Angel fans still around from back on your first album. And I remember that album because I, I saw Queensryche open for Metallica, and wow. I think it was 88 or 89. And that led me, I was there for Queensryche, not Metallica. And that led me to Fifth Angel. And your first Ooh. album, when it came out, was it made a pretty big splash. And everybody thought, oh, this is the next big thing. And you guys did get a lot of attention. and and it was killer music, but then you guys, after your second album, had a pretty big break. So talk a little bit about that. Well, I think uh, there, were, there were a few things that happened, but certainly the grunge era kicking in uh, had a lot to do with it from a business perspective. I mean, nowadays you have things like YouTube and you have Instagram and Facebook, so if you wanna stay in touch with your fans, you can really do that now, even if you didn't have a record company. And back then, uh, we did lose our deal um, they didn't want to pick up another option after the Time Will Tell album just because the scene had changed so dramatically. And that sort of put the, you know, it, it sort, of, sort of closed the door on all that for us. So, yeah, there was certainly a huge period where there was nothing going on with the band. And uh, that's why for, for us it was exciting to see that, you know, wow, there's, there's really some, uh, really a fan base in Europe for us still. And that was... That was a great thing to find out. Right, and so then you guys did The Third Secret, and it was very well received. So is that what led to doing the fourth album, the new album? Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, the third secret, um, that was sort of our first album. I think it, I think at the time it was the first album we had done in 28 years or something <laughs> like Crazy. that. Crazy. So, yeah, it was it was a, lo <laughs> a little bit of time. <laughs> That's a bit of a records. break. But, I mean, you a did. A little bit of a break. I mean, you did, you were <clears throat> touring with Alice Cooper. You did House sure. of Lords. I mean, you were doing a lot of other projects. Sure, I was. But as far as the band, you yeah. know, that was the first album we did in, in uh, I think it was 28 years at the time. And... Um, we were nervous about it. You know, we were very concerned because we knew that the first two albums were considered classics in Europe, and we, you know, we're, you're fighting at that point nostalgia, which is a very powerful, powerful force. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, how are we going to make a record that people are, you know, not going to immediately hate because it's different? <laughs> right. It's, it's going to be different. You know, 28 years later. And um, but but somehow we I think we really were successful in making music that still sounded like Fifth Angel. It was still exciting and still moved us, and it was exciting to us. So mm -hmm. I think that that really uh, I think that's why it was received very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, but I will say that most of the pressure for us was on Third Secret. You know after after that long of a period of not releasing any music and then having to release an album that's very stressful this album was less stressful because of the third secret well yeah. and and steve that's when you entered the picture right was right around the time of the third secret after it came out in october um is uh, november is when i started so. and so when you came into it did you feel any of that pressure um knowing that you had to come in and fill some pretty big shoes and that, that inevitably there's always going to be people that compare you to the original singer, Ted Pilot, or even mm -hmm. the singer on the other albums. So how did you prepare for that? What was your mindset coming into this? My job at the time was to emulate Ted as best as I could and still be me, right? Yeah. Um, and bring that energy, maybe even bring more, if possible, uh, energy to it. I didn't find out that I was going to actually do all of uh, you know, the Third Secret songs um, at the next show in February until like a month before when we lost our guitar player at that time. Well, you jumped in and you really owned it. And I mean, I've got to say your vocals are unbelievable on the okay. album. So let's Thank talk you. about the album because, <laughs> Ken, what were you thinking? This is your fourth <laughs> album. And what were you thinking? What were you thinking? It's, a, thinking? it's a double vinyl, almost 70 minutes of music concept album. So, I mean, that's a pretty ambitious thing to tackle. What inspired that? Well, we were originally talking about doing a concept record back around the third secret, but we just didn't have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, so this time, uh, I talked to the label, I talked to Yop, and he goes, you know, it'd be really cool if you did a double vinyl. And so at the time, you know, we thought, wow, you know, that is a really cool idea. You know, mm -hmm. let's do a, a double vinyl. And then we got into the process of actually <laughs> writing it and, and, and trying to figure out how, you know, like how many songs we needed and how, how much time we'd what have. What were you thinking? And then it was like, <laughs> what, what were you thinking exactly at that point? But so it did turn into a little bit of, more of a project than we anticipated. But like we feel very happy. We feel like we really crafted each and every song and really tried to make it something exciting uh, for the listeners and also for the Fifth Angel fans. We did something that I think is unique. I don't think anybody's done it before. We took all the concepts, sometimes even song titles, sometimes even lyrics from the previous three albums, and we wove them into a cohesive story oh, interesting. for When Angels Kill. And so when somebody's listening to this, and if they're a fan, you know, they'll hear little snippets. They'll hear a song title, or they'll hear a lyric that they've heard before that ties into the story and actually references them back to the previous albums. So if they want to find out more about the story, they can actually go back mm -hmm. and listen to songs from the other albums. Oh, that's very cool. So tell me about the process of recording a, a concept album. How do you start, because there is a definite storyline to this entire album, mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy and I listened to the full thing, and you really mm -hmm. have to sit down and get in that zone because it is it is heavy and there's a lot of big themes in this record so how did you guys come up with the storyline and the distinct characters tell me a little bit about that process well we we actually had a a, a framework of a story that um that we had worked on and we sent it around to the whole band and everybody looked at it and and uh, a funny story i remember um our bass player john uh, he got he got the story and he goes, is there another? Do you have like any other ideas? <laughs> 
Do you have, do you have some different ideas? He he wasn't yeah, really, he, didn't, he wasn't, wasn't sure. necessarily a big fan of the story. I mean, it's a con it, well, it was a complicated story. But if you who look came at, up with that framework? Well, the framework it was uh, well, I would say it was probably mostly me, and um, there were some other. I, I, but honestly, you know, the reason I can't say well, the reason I say mostly me is because. The really the concepts were taken from the previous three albums, and okay. just just trying to thread Weave some it. of the themes. Like if you look what we were talking about as teenagers, which is really funny. I mean, we we're talking about things like terrorism and betrayal and war Weave and it. and and deception in media and all these different <laughs> Good things. Good versus evil, power, and, and, and it's still applicable today, like 100% applicable. So it was really cool to look back and, and review all these lyrics and then just kind of pull from those and then try to weave them into the story. So I guess, in a sense, you know, I was the one who had the idea of, of doing that. But in terms of, you know, who wrote the story, well, those previous albums kind of wrote the story. So okay. I, think, I think we all had a, a pretty good hand in that, if that makes sense. So how did you overcome John's hesitation? <laughs> well, we just started making the record, actually. <laughs> we just started making the record, and he heard some of the songs, and he's like, wow, you know, this is, you know, he was very excited <laughs> about it. And uh, so the more material we started doing and the more the songs started coming together, he just heard it and, and uh, he was excited like we were. You know, I think we were all feeling s like something really special was happening. Like, like musically, we were, we, were, we were happy with it. And I think, you know, I always say this in interviews, but, but if we're happy with it and we're feeling excited about it, then we kind of know we're onto something because, um, you know, if you're ever working on a song and you're like, well, I don't really like this song, don't put it on a record. Right. You know, if you don't like it as the artist, why should anybody else like exactly. it? Exactly. So, so we, we have always tried to do this as a philosophy for this band, and really almost any band that I've been in, we always try to make sure that we make ourselves happy first, and this is something we're excited about. And then if we're excited about it and we love it, then hopefully we'll find one to seven million people <laughs> that will also like it. They're out there. They're going to love it. One to seven, eight, nine million people. <laughs>